Well, for those of you with reasonable memories, we return to our studies in Paul's letter to the Galatians. <clears throat> and we read from chapter 3, verse 15 through to verse 20. You remember perhaps why Paul was constrained to write this letter to the Galatians. He had heard news that the believers in Galatia, uh, which was probably the Roman provinces that is today uh, western Turkey, that the believers in Galatia who had come to faith in Christ through Paul's ministry in his first and second evangelistic tours, that these believers were in grave danger of sliding back into Judaism, of going back to that, says Paul in chapter 1, which is no gospel at all, of going back to thinking that God receives us and accepts us wholly on the basis of our obeying his law. They were slipping back into legal religion. They were doing this under pressure. People had come from the church's headquarters in Jerusalem, men of prominence, men of persuasive power, no doubt, and they were saying, well, yes, it's all very well to believe in Jesus. Yes, indeed, Jesus is the Messiah. But in addition to Jesus, you also need to submit to the law of Moses. And Paul writes in the clearest of terms that to do so would be to abandon the gospel of Christ and the grace of God. To do so would be to cut yourself off from Christ because Christ and Christ alone saves. Faith in Christ alone brings us into a right relationship with God. Paul is not in any sense disparaging the law. He is seeking to help them rightly understand the place of the law in the economy of God's grace. And so it is in this controversial, out of this controversial uh, disputation that Paul writes this letter to the Galatians because what is at issue is nothing less than first the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ and the eternal well-being of these men and women to whom he is writing, which perhaps accounts for the fervency of spirit that manifests itself throughout this letter. Now, in verses 15 following of chapter 3, Paul is continuing to argue and to illustrate the tragic folly of basing a right relationship with God on our keeping of the Mosaic law, of imagining that by keeping the commandments, of submitting to what the law has said, we could ever be received into a right relationship with God. Now, back in chapter 3, for example, at verse 10, Paul had already underscored the utter futility and tragedy of imagining that by keeping the law and by serving the law and observing the law, we could be put right with God. All who rely on observing the law are under a curse. Now, the curse of God is his eternal anathema. For it is written, cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. Base your relationship to God on observing the law and you are under the divine curse and face the prospect of being forever excluded from the presence of God. Now you might think, well, having made this point so clearly and so dramatically, what is Paul doing continuing to go over old ground well, simply, I think, for this reason, Paul is so concerned that these Christian men and women might see from every conceivable angle that God has only ever had but one way of saving sinners. 
And that way has only ever been through faith in his promises and supremely faith in the Son who is the fulfillment of the promises of God. Paul goes over the same ground again and again and again. I'll be meeting with someone for the, a few times over these past few weeks and I had given her uh, the task happy I thought of reading through John chapter 1 for our next meeting she read the whole gospel and uh, I said tell me what was your first impression she says well Jesus seems to say the same thing over and over again and I said that's good that you recognise that why do you think he does that and she said very simply to show the people how important it was and I said precisely and so it is with Paul he repeats himself again and again and again because nothing is more vital than understanding this truth and the way Paul does it in verses 15 following is to establish the priority and superiority of God's covenant with Abraham over his covenant with Moses First of all then, in verses 15 to 18, Paul establishes the priority of God's covenant with Abraham over his covenant with Moses. Brothers, let me take an example from everyday life. Let me reduce it down to a level that hopefully you'll be able to follow. Just as no one can set aside or add to a human covenant, and the word can be translated covenant or will or testament, that has been duly established, So it is in this case. The promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. And almost in parenthesis, he says, the scripture does not say unto seeds, meaning many people, but unto your seed, meaning one person who is Christ. Put that in parenthesis and you'll get the flow of the argument. What I mean is this, the law, the dispensation of Moses, introduced 430 years after Abraham, received the promises of God does not set aside the covenant previously established by God with Abraham and thus do away with the promise the promise being that Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness the promise that through Abraham and in Abraham all the nations of the earth will be blessed that ultimately came to fruition when Christ came from the line of Abraham from the seed of David a covenant doesn't set aside a covenant previously established by God and do away with the promise for if the inheritance depends on the law that is if our receiving the salvation of God and the the inheritance of God's forgiveness and the hope of heaven depends on our observing the law then it follows that it no longer depends on the promise But God, in his grace, in his unmerited kindness, gave it to Abraham through a promise. Paul is establishing here the priority of God's covenant with Abraham over his covenant with Moses. Now, the significance of this has already been highlighted in verses 69 of chapter 3. Consider Abraham. He believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. What brought Abraham into a right relationship with God he believed God he didn't do anything he didn't merit anything he didn't perform anything he believed what God had spoken and in these verses Paul is underscoring this by establishing the historical priority of the Abrahamic covenant which came 430 years before the covenant of Sinai given through Moses now Paul's argument here in these early verses is from the lesser to the greater what he's saying is if a duly established human covenant or testament or will cannot be set aside then how much more does that hold with a divine covenant how much more if God has established something unilaterally because God didn't come to Abram and say, Now, Abraham, 
let's enter into a bargain. Here's what I'm going to do, do, and here's what you're going to do. God unilaterally established his covenant with Abraham. And Paul's point is very simple here. If in a human covenant that reality can't be set aside after it has been duly established, so it is in this case. The covenant which came 430 years before Moses doesn't somehow just pass away into oblivion. When a new covenant is established, it still holds, it still has priority. The problem was they weren't understanding the relationship of these covenants. And the truth was they were really part of the one covenant, the Mosaic covenant being a further elaboration of the Abrahamic covenant. But we'll come to that later. The Abrahamic covenant came 430 years before the Mosaic covenant of the law. The dispensation inaugurated in and through Moses does not set aside, as he puts it, does not set aside the covenant given with Abraham, the covenant previously established by God, and thus do away with the promise. That is, with the fact that salvation has always been through believing God's promise, not by obeying the law of Moses. The coming of the law of Moses did not annul, did not overturn the way God goes about justifying the ungodly. Now, this is what Paul is underscoring in verse 18. If the inheritance depends on the law, then it no longer depends on a promise, But God in his grace gave it to Abram through a promise. If the inheritance now depends on the law, God has changed his mind. God is fickle. God is changeable. He has operated one way with Abraham and now he's turning it upside down and operating a different way with Moses. But God in his grace gave it to Abraham through a promise. So the inheritance doesn't depend on the law because God isn't changeable. God's modus operandi, if you like, God's way of forgiving and reconciling and saving sinners is consistent. He gave it to Abraham in his grace through his unmerited kindness, not because Abraham deserved it or merited it. God is not changeable. God can't be charged with double standards of making the inheritance now depend not on believing his promise, but on achieving his law. To think like this, he's saying to them, really, you're making God out to be changeable. And he's really knocking every conceivable um, bastion of refuge from them. To think like this, he's saying, do you see what you're doing to the character of God? You're impugning his integrity his immutability, his unchangeableness. If God is so fickle and so changeable, we wouldn't know where we are with him. But God in his grace gave it to Abram through a promise. Now you'll notice in verse 16 that Paul further strengthens his argument in this way. Because not only was God's covenant with Abram, it was with Abraham's seed, meaning Christ. Now, there are many, many, many different interpretations of this verse. I'll tell you what I think is the simplest, although I'm not quite sure it's right. I'm not quite sure how we understand this verse, but I'll tell you what I think is the simplest. The promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. Now, what does that mean, first of all? Who were Abraham's seed? Not everyone that came from Abraham because Ishmael did not belong to Abraham's seed the promise was not passed through the line of Ishmael but through the line of Isaac you see the same thing with the birth of Esau and Jacob to Isaac the promises of God did not run through both of the sons Jacob have I loved 
Esau have I hated. So the seed of Abraham is the line of promise, the line of faith. Okay? The scripture does not say unto seeds, meaning many people, but unto your seed, meaning one person who is Christ. Now, there are many different and very obscure um, explanations given to this. The simplest, I think, is this. He's saying that when God said to Abraham, Genesis 22, the promise is to you and to your seed. Paul is saying that promise comes to its fulfillment in the one in whom the whole line and seed of faith are to be found. That is Christ. Christ is the head, the covenant head of the seed of faith. And so the argument he's, he's underscoring here, I think, is this. He's saying Christ is the fulfillment and fullness of God's covenant promise to Abraham. He is the one in whom the promise is ultimately realized. He is the one who realizes the promise and who by his sin-bearing death and resurrection brings salvation to a reality. So the point he's making is that Christ is identified foundationally, not with the covenant given through Moses, but with the covenant given through Abraham. Therefore, Christ and his salvation is a salvation received not by achieving, but by believing. Now, I know it might be hard to, to follow, but I don't want to go over it again. One of my feelings is thinking, I'm not explaining that well enough, go back and do it again, and for, I've, no, I've tried four or five times, and the time is gone. If you've not followed it, ask me later. So, here we have the historical priority of the covenant of God with Abraham. For God to have changed it, God himself would have had to change. Now that then raises, doesn't it, and would have raised for Jews and for converted Gentiles this question. Well, okay, the covenant given to Abram is prior to the law, but what then are you saying about the law? What's the point and purpose of the law? Are you saying it's of no account? Are you saying that we should just ignore God's covenant with Moses? What about the commandments and the whole Mosaic dispensation? What's the whole point of it, Paul? Verses 19 and 20. What then was the purpose of the law? Paul is anticipating the question. It was added because of transgressions until the seed to whom the promise referred had come. And you'll see that the seed clearly refers to Christ. Uh, the head of the seed, the covenant head, the, the one in whom the seed finds fulfillment and realization. The law was put into effect through angels by a mediator. A mediator, however, does not represent just one party, but God is one. That 20th verse has, I am reliably told, over 350 interpretations. And tonight we're going to just consider one. Uh, it's a very fascinating verse. I've not yet read two commentaries that have the same understanding. Uh, so if you want to know more, you can just spend many a happy hour considering the 350 or so different interpretations. How then does Paul answer this question? What's the purpose of the law? First of all, understand what he means by the law. By the law, he does not mean as such the Ten Commandments. By the law here, he means the whole Mosaic dispensation. The whole uh, way that God dealt with his people, beginning with Moses, and their establishing as a theocratic nation, as a nation with God as its king. The whole kit and caboodle of Exodus through uh, Deuteronomy. The whole Mosaic dispensation, the, the, the types, the sacrifices, the priests, the Levites, uh, all the minutiae that you read about and you scratch your head and think, what on earth is that about? I remember the first time I read through Leviticus as a young Christian, I just gave it up. I thought it was gobbledygook. I couldn't make head nor tail of what it was saying. 
I didn't know what it meant. I was totally at sea. Now, that's one reason why we need to read the New Testament to understand the Old Testament. What then was the purpose of God in inaugurating this whole dispensation beginning with Moses? Paul's answer to that takes two forms. First of all, he says, in effect, these Judaizers who are troubling you have failed to understand the law's purpose. What then is the purpose of the law? It was added because of transgressions. The whole Mosaic dispensation, its laws, its sacrifices and its ceremonies were an addition. They weren't an original. They were an addition. They were given by God and established by God because of sin. And we'll see what that means in a moment. They were an addition. If you like, a divine afterthought, putting it in human language. A divine afterthought, not that God has got any afterthoughts. But putting it in the same way the scripture says God repents. It doesn't repent, but it uses what we call as anthropomorphisms. Human way of speaking. A divine afterthought because of sin. We and our sinfulness were responsible for the whole dispensation of Moses. That's the first thing. Secondly, it was a temporary addition. It was added because of transgressions until the seed, that is Christ, to whom the promise referred had come, then it wouldn't be needed. Now, what does all that mean? The many various aspects of the Mosaic law, the sacrifices, the tabernacle, the regulations that leave your hair standing at end at times, and you wonder, what on earth is the point of all this? Badger skins and kosher food and not doing this and doing that. It just seems absurd. But you see, all of that was given by God to preserve Israel's identity in an ungodly world. All of it were like hedges. God was hedging his people about in every area of life to make them different. He couldn't trust them to be different because of sin. And they so wanted to be like everyone else. And so God gives them all of this, these regulations that cover every area of life. From cradle to grave and everything in between, what you eat and what you don't eat, what you wear and what you don't wear, where you go and where you don't go. But all of it was to be a hedge to preserve them from becoming absorbed in a godless world and so losing their identity as the people of God and so drifting away from the God who could save them and secure their eternal well-being. That's the whole point uh, of verse 23. Before this faith came with Christ, we were held prisoners by the law. He's speaking of believers. But they were like prisoners because the law locked them up, treated them like minors. You know how children sometimes, when they're growing up, get a bit frustrated. You know, what? Why are you treating me like this? I'm, 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 I'm grown up. And inside you say to yourself, yeah, well, behave like it. Um, and this, you say, no, 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 you need these restrictions. The time will come when you come of age, when we hope that you'll enter your mental and emotional maturity. Hope springs eternal for parents. That you'll enter into that and you won't need these little rules and regulations, when you must be in bed, who you must play with, who you must not play with, where you go, where you don't go. When a building's complete, you take down all the scaffolding, don't you? But when it's being built, you need the scaffolding to keep it in place. And so the Mosaic Law was added, like a scaffolding to keep us in place, to keep the identity and truth of God in the world uncontaminated as much as possible from the inroads of an unbelieving world. That's his first argument. That's why the law was given. 
to bring us to Christ, not, not to save us, but to keep us from being lost. And secondly, he shows the further superiority of the covenant with Abraham, which was a covenant of salvation. In this very important but very, very difficult passage, the law was put into effect through angels by a mediator. Now, the only uh, Bible reference to substantiate this, obviously Paul is speaking by revelation from the Spirit, is Deuteronomy 33, 2. The law was put into effect through angels by a mediator, Moses being the mediator. He was the one through whom the law of God, the whole dispensation was given to the people and that was communicated to Moses, not directly by God, but through angels. Okay? A mediator, however, does not represent just one party, but God is one. Now, what would you make of that? I'll tell you what I think it means. The Israelites, now remember he's trying to establish further the superiority of the covenant of Abraham over the covenant with Moses. Now by superiority I mean it in the same way that Hebrews 8 and 9 mean it. The Israelites received the law through angels and then through Moses. That is, they received the whole law dispensation twice removed from God. God gave it through angels angels gave it through Moses and Moses gave it to the people the whole of that dispensation came twice removed but the Abrahamic covenant was given directly to God by Abraham face to face it didn't come twice removed a mediator however does not represent just one party but God is one meaning in the covenant with Moses there was a mediator a go-between, in fact there were two Moses and the angels but not with Abraham God came to him face to face now someone might say well um, but Christ is called the mediator 1 Timothy 2.5 uh, Hebrews 8 and 9 there is one mediator between God and man the man Christ Jesus here we have a mediator ah but in Christ's case he is God the mediator he is not once removed from God he is God do you see the point that Paul is seeking to establish here that whatever way you look at it from whatever angle the Abrahamic covenant stands as the original it wasn't an addition it wasn't a divine afterthought because of sin it was the divine original and in that covenant God himself gave his promise to Abraham it didn't come once removed it didn't come twice removed and so what Paul is seeking to do here in all that he is writing is to help people to see two things. First, God has only ever had one way of justifying sinners. And that way is exemplified in his dealing with Abraham. That's why in Romans 4, Paul speaks of Abraham as the archetypal man of faith. You want to know what faith is, and if you want to know what faith brings in the grace of God, look at Abraham. There has never been a day when God has offered to sinners justification through law. Never. He brings us back to our own bankruptcy and says, if you're going to be saved, you'll believe my promise which is encapsulated in his son. And the other thing that perhaps Paul is seeking to underscore here is if they fail to see this, what they are doing is cutting themselves off from the hope 
of salvation. That's this, this isn't some kind of erudite theological controversy. This is to do with eternal destinies. That's why when we read through the scriptures and we come to passages like this and we think, well, I don't know what that means. Just hurry over that to a verse that perhaps stands out. We've got to understand that in all that God is saying here, he is speaking into our experiences. And what God has revealed, he has revealed so that we might the better understand him, the better understand ourselves, and the better understand how we can be saved and how we can live as those who have been saved. That's why we have to grapple with with whatever grey matter God's given us and to try and understand the argument of Paul here. What then was the great failure of these Galatians and of the Judaizers who were uh, subverting them? They had uprooted law from its position and place in the whole economy of God in the whole work of God they had uprooted it from its place after the covenant of grace with Abraham and they had put it where it ought not to have been and when you uproot something from where it naturally belongs and put it where it doesn't naturally belong it withers and dies that's why when people imagine that what the Bible is is a series of rungs and a ladder to climb to get nearer to God we just offer people a counsel of despair imagine saying to people God's given us this book he's given us all these commandments and if you keep them you'll go to heaven if you don't you'll go to hell that basically is how many people think you wouldn't put it as starkly as that That's not the point. The law comes after the gospel. God converts us. He saves us. He implants a new principle of life within us. And then says, now, let me show you how I want you to live. The scaffolding's all away now. You don't need the scaffolding. You have my spirit in your heart. You've come of age, as chapter 4 will say. Now, here's my law. Shorn of all its temporary additions. Now, here's how to live as those who have received a new principle. The principle of new life from God in the soul. That's why we need to hold together gospel and law in their proper balance. And not either so stress gospel that the law becomes a forgotten afterthought or so stress law that the gospel becomes an afterthought one leads to antinomianism and one leads to legalism the law and the gospel come together but the gospel has the priority because only the gospel can enable us by the grace of God to love the law of God to seek after the law of God to make the law of God our delight because to the unrenewed heart the law of God is a chore at best but to the renewed heart the words of David in Psalm 119 are its deepest echo oh how I love your commandments they are sweeter to me than honey from the honeycomb That's what Paul is saying. I hope in some measure we've been able to to understand it. Well, maybe we'll sing.